Well, we're in a message series now in January called Praying with Jesus. And the point of this series is that God wants us to grow in our prayer lives. God wants us to learn to pray better. And what should our goals be in prayer? I believe our goal should be twofold. First of all, our goal should be to grow in our relationship with God, to get to know Him better. Prayer can build that relationship with God in a way that no other activity in our lives can do. Secondly, God wants your prayers to be answered. Sometimes we think of God as up in heaven with his arms crossed and just shaking her head. No, not good enough. I'm not going to do that one. No. But God wants our prayers to be answered. He wants us to pray prayers that he has the answers for. And the Bible contains a large amount of teaching and how we can pray so that our prayers are answered. James 5.16. I remind you that in the middle of your bulletin is a white page. I'd encourage you to pull that out. It has the scriptures written out. You can take some notes. On the back is a study guide that we use in our small groups. And you can also use in your personal study based on the message this morning. James 5.16 says, The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. That's the kind of prayer I want to have, powerful and effective prayers. Powerful and effective prayers are prayers that get answered, even in difficult or seemingly impossible situations. Now, one of the hindrances to prayer is that we often don't approach God in prayer with what I would call proper respect. Prayer is not just getting our prayer list into God and then moving on in life. Prayer has a lot, is a lot more than that. Prayer ought to be two-way communication. Talk about that a lot. What does that mean? It means, yes, we're talking to God, but we're also listening for what God would say to us. That's how a relationship with God grows. If you have a relationship with another person and one of the parties in the relationship does all the talking and the other one never says anything, that's not much of a relationship, is it? But God wants a back and forth in our relationship with him, a back and forth in prayer. And as we learn to listen to God, we're going to also see more of our prayers answered. But sometimes we forget to listen to what God has to say to us. And I'd like us to watch a video clip which illustrates this common problem. It's called Coffee with Jesus. Well, I think the point is clear, isn't it? Something's wrong when we do all the talking and Jesus can't get in a word edgewise. He wants to talk to you. He's got something to say too. And we need to listen. Perhaps we have an exaggerated view of our own importance. You know, it's all about us. But it's not about him and what he wants. My message today is entitled, The Fear of the Lord. I'm not sure the guy in the video had much fear of the Lord, did he? People don't talk much about the fear of the Lord today, it's not a popular sermon topic, and yet it's talked about many times in Scripture. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One. Understanding is understanding. And so when we understand better what it means to fear or to be in awe of a holy God, it will lead to wisdom and understanding in our lives, particularly in our prayer life. Now in this series, Praying with Jesus, we're looking basically at the Lord's Prayer as an outline and we're taking different of the phrases in the Lord's Prayer and then expanding on them with other passages in the Bible. Today we're going to be talking about the request in Matthew 6 verse 9, Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. What does that actually mean? Hallowed means to set apart as... as as holy, to treat something as holy. It says, hallowed be your name, the name of God. That's synonymous with who he is. In the Bible, a name of somebody, particularly the name of God, symbolizes everything about his character, everything about who he is. And so the name of God and God himself are one in the, really one in the same. And so this request, hallowed be your name, is asking God to move first on our hearts that we would treat his name, that we would treat him as holy, that we would have a reverence, a fear, a respect of God. And secondly, when we say, hallowed be your name, we're praying that 
others would treat God as holy. That others around us, others we know, others in our city, others in our country would hallow the name of God, would treat him with respect and reverence. Now when I look around at our society, I, I don't believe on a whole that God's name is being respected, is being hallowed. I don't see much fear of the Lord in our culture, in our society either. And that's what this prayer is about, that that would change, beginning in our life and then spreading to those around us. And for that to happen, we must see God, we must see our King as being holy. Today we're going to look at a passage in Isaiah chapter 6. And I trust that we will learn more about the fear of the Lord as we look at this passage it begins in verse 1 and says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. Now this is Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet speaking. The passage that we're going to look at this morning in Isaiah 6 describes an incredible encounter that Isaiah had with God. And this encounter or vision, we don't know exactly where he was or how he saw God, but this encounter impacted and set the course for the whole rest of Isaiah's life and ministry. The human king of Israel, King Uzziah, who was a good king, had recently died. And during the year after his death, Isaiah had a vision of the Lord. And what he saw was the Lord seated upon a throne in the midst of the temple. And this throne represents the kingly rule of God. Even though the earthly king had died, the heavenly king was still ruling. We must realize that the Lord is awesome. He says, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. You know, in the Bible, it's rare for somebody to actually see God. It's rare for somebody to actually see the Lord, but when they do, he's awesome. And as we read the accounts, it seems that words fail to describe what the person is really seeing, what they're experiencing. Here Isaiah describes the Lord as high and exalted. Undoubtedly, the, the throne that the Lord was seated on was magnificently huge. And Isaiah was just a small person at the foot of the throne. It towered above him. The Lord was covered with a robe and the train of the robe was so huge it filled the entire temple. That was quite a robe. That was so incredible, there was hardly any place for Isaiah to stand. The next thing that Isaiah saw was powerful angels worshiping the Lord. It says, above him, that's above the Lord, seated upon his throne were seraphs. Each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. And with two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Now, this is the only mention in the Bible of seraphs. Seraphs are powerful angels. Their name means burning ones, and we believe that their appearance was like a flame of fire. The seraphs covered their faces because God was so awesome that it was too much for them to look upon His greatness. They covered their feet in a show of humility. And as they flew, they worshiped God, calling to one another, holy, holy, holy. In the Hebrew, words are repeated to show their importance. They proclaim the holiness of the Lord Almighty. And they said, His glory fills the whole earth. We may not see it with our eyes, but it's filling the whole earth. And when these powerful seraphs worshiped, you know, oftentimes we see these angels, they're just little twinkly things, you know, and dainty little girl-like creatures. And that's not what angels are like at all. I mean, if we saw the way angels are depicted, we'd say, oh, isn't that cute? But when people see angels in the Bible, they fall flat on their face. They're scared out of their gourds because angels are awesome and, and uh, very powerful and when these seraphs worshipped, their voices were so loud that the very foundation of the temple shook. And the air was filled with smoke. 
either from the burning of the seraphs or the, the glory of God or everything all combined. It was an awesome sight that Isaiah saw. And this is a picture of worship in heaven. It's a window into God's name being hallowed in heaven right now. What Isaiah saw back then is still happening in heaven. The seraphs are there worshiping the Lord Almighty. Mentioned one time in the Bible, how many other creatures are there? We see at other places worshiping God. And one of the biggest impediments to prayer is an inaccurate understanding of who God is. God is awesome. He's incredibly powerful. He's holy. He's beyond human description. And when we see God the way he truly is, we have a healthy fear, a healthy reverence, a healthy awe of him. Now, how can we see God the way he truly is and not just the way people imagine him to be? The first answer is through the pages of the Bible. Just as we're doing this morning, we, we see a picture of God. Through this vision of Isaiah written down, we, we can begin to see at least a glimpse of what Isaiah saw. And we begin to understand what God is really like. God's word serves as this window into the unseen world and shows us things that we couldn't possibly see on our own. It shows God in all his holiness. And as you read the Bible, ask God to reveal to you who he really is through his word and through his spirit, that we might see the holy king seated on the throne and that we might bow before him in worship. Because when we see God for who he is, when we see him as he truly appears, then we must respond to his holiness. As I said before, when people see angels in the Bible, they they. They are filled with fear. They often fall to the ground because angels are incredibly powerful beings. They're awesome in appearance. But angels are also holy. They're without sin. Now we're speaking of God's angels. Now everything in our world around us is so tainted with sin. It's so tainted with sin's effects that, that to see something that is holy, a creature that's holy without sin, has a huge impact on a person. And angels just have an infinitesimal portion of the holiness of God. And so what was Isaiah's response when he saw this vision of God, uh, the holy king seated upon the throne and the seraphs worshiping him? In verse 5, Isaiah says, Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah knew full well that the scripture said that nobody can see God and live. And... He was full of fear. Now why is that the case? Because God is holy and and any man is sinful. And the presence of God's holiness will annihilate any sinful man that stood in his presence. It would totally destroy him. And so Isaiah admitted he's a sinner. He's a man of unclean lips. Even the words of his mouth were tainted with sin. And he lived among a people who were sinful, the people of Israel. And his eyes had now seen the king, the the Lord Almighty, the Holy One, and he realized the great distance between the Holy God and himself, a sinner. He feared that he would be destroyed, that he would die, but God was merciful. And he gave Isaiah the opportunity to receive forgiveness. It says, Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. The altar in the temple. The altar in the temple was a place where animal sacrifices were made for the atonement of sin. And it pointed forward to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God on the cross, for the forgiveness of the sins of the world. And so the seraph, the burning one, took this coal from the fire and took it over to Isaiah and touched his lips. The angel pronounced that his guilt was removed, his sin was atoned for. And so the result was that Isaiah could stand in the presence of the holy God and live because he had been forgiven. 
And so as we better understand, as we appreciate the holiness of God, it inspires us to personal holiness. It makes clear the sin in our lives. And it should cause us to repent. In fact, this is commanded by God. 1 Peter 1, verse 15 says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, God's speaking here, be holy because... I am holy. And so when we see God in his holiness, it inspires us to be holy. Now, how can we be holy? Holy is a consecration of our entire self, a setting apart of ourself for the purpose of God. It's living righteously in obedience to God. It's being sensitive to any sin in our lives and asking for Jesus to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we could live in his presence. Holiness is hallowing the name of God. Hallowed be your name in, in my life. It's having a respect and reverence for God and his name. It's not taking the name of the Lord in vain. Because that's not honoring him. And when you live a holy life, guess what? You're going to stand out. You're going to stand out in our society because not many are living those, that kind of life. And so when we pray, hallowed be your name, we're not only praying for ourselves and our response to a holy God, but we're praying for others as well. And we need to tell others to fear the Lord. And so those of us who have seen God's holiness and, and it's becoming more of a reality to us and we're growing in our fear of the Lord, we have the privilege and the responsibility to tell others about God's holiness. God is looking for people to do that. God is looking for witnesses. So Isaiah is standing before the Lord. The Lord is seated upon the throne. The seraphs are flying around and calling out with very loud voices. His lips have been touched. His sin has been forgiven. And then it says in verse 8, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And so Isaiah hears the Lord asking, Who is us? Well, it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's the Trinity. The Lord was asking who, that, who he could send to tell Israel his message. Israel had drifted away from the things of God. God was looking for a spokesman. He was looking for a witness to tell the nation about his holiness. To call the people to repentance. And Isaiah volunteered for that mission of God. Verse 8. Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. And God said, go and tell this people. And then he goes on to give Isaiah the message that he was to proclaim. And so Isaiah asked God to send him. God said, whom shall I send? And Isaiah said, here I am. I volunteer. Send me. I want to do it. I've seen you in your holiness. And I want to tell the people about you. And Isaiah enjoyed a long ministry as God's prophet and witness to the nation of Israel. Many of the people did not respond to his message, but some did. Isaiah was faithful to God's commission to tell others about this holy God. And to tell them to repent and fear God. Now just as God has placed Isaiah on this earth with a purpose... So he has placed each one of us here on this earth with a purpose as well. And our first purpose is to, to, to enter into and to grow in our relationship with God. And our next purpose is to help others find God. And just as God was looking for volunteers, just as God was looking for someone to spread his message back in those days, thousands of years ago, so he is looking for people today to tell others about him. In fact, those who have truly seen God as Isaiah saw him, we cannot help but want to tell others about him. Tell others the good news about who he is. And the more we appreciate the holiness and awesomeness of God, the more motivated we're going to be to tell others about him, the less fear we'll have about speaking to others. And so as we pray, hallowed be your name. Let's think about what it means. We're praying that God's name would be reverenced in our families. We're praying that God's name would be feared in our church and in our country. 
Now, who can truly hallow or respect God's name? It's only those who have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, who have come to know him. And that's why we need to be witnesses. God is being worshipped in heaven by seraphs right now. All kinds of pre creatures and people who have gone on before are worshipping God in heaven. And heaven is shaking with the sound of the praise and worship. And as we hallow God's name, we join in this worship in heaven. And God desires more worshipers. And so he's asking us this morning, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I pray that each of us this morning and throughout the week and throughout the rest of this new year would, would answer God's question with the same response that Isaiah gave. And we would say to God, here am I. Send me. I volunteer to go. I volunteer to tell somebody else about you. I've seen your holiness. I know who you are. And I want to tell somebody else. And so I trust this morning that each of us has a clear vision of who this holy king that we serve really is. And as we pray together, let us respond to God's holiness with repentance and a resolve to tell others about Jesus so that many more can worship the king. Now to really hallow God's name, you need to have committed your life to Jesus Christ. To do that, you need to admit that you've sinned. Secondly, you need to believe that Jesus died on the cross to forgive your sins. And finally, commit your life to following him as your Lord. So I'd like to ask you to bow your heads right now. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. If you never prayed a prayer like this before, I encourage you to pray along with me. If you'd like to recommit your life to the Lord, that would be great too. Father, this morning, I admit that I've sinned. I've done wrong things. When I look at your holiness, I realize my life is filled with sin. But I believe that Jesus came and died on the cross, the perfect sacrifice, that my sins might be forgiven. Please forgive me. Come into my life. I commit myself to following you as my Lord and Savior all the days of my life. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. Amen.